Hello and welcome to Digital Futures. Today we have a very interesting session um, with uh, Hasham Shoki, uh, who will be teaching us and who will be walking us through some of the basics of uh, Grasshopper and uh, working through some of the generative design uh, techniques in uh, uh, using mesh modeling techniques, mesh manipulation, and inside of Rhinoceros 3D and Grasshopper. Before we begin this session, I want to remind our audience of our upcoming sessions uh, with the Digital Futures uh, initiatives with, uh, in the language Farsi. So uh, the next session, uh, next Farsi session would be held on 11th of Feb. And the session is uh, on um, uh, uh, In Search of Identity, the Past Along the Future. And there are many more sessions lined up for this uh, upcoming month. Uh, you can find more information about the upcoming session and our calendar for, for the month uh, in our newsletter. Uh, before I give, give the platform to Hashem, I would like to take an opportunity to just give a very quick uh, introduction to him. Uh, Hashem is an architect, computational designer and researcher focusing on computational design, artificial intelligence in the field of architecture and urban development. Currently, he is working at the Institute of Advanced Architecture of Catalonia as a researcher and teaching assistant. He has received his master's degree in advanced computation for architecture and design in 2021. His research interests focus on digitizing handcrafts using machine learning and robotic fabrication. He has been teaching many courses and workshops related to computational design and digital fabrication since 2017. Harshan, the platform is all yours. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for the introduction. How are you guys? Um, are you are you set? All good? Um, before I start, uh, start the session, I just dropped a link in the chat. And this thing is for our Google Drive. So I'm going to share my screen and, and show you guys what you need to download from there. So this thing should lead you to this page uh, where you can find uh, the plugins, and images and files. Uh, the most important thing now is you can that you guys can go to to the plugins folder, and then install these two guys. The third one is not very important, but at least you have to get Fatener and Relative Neighborhood components, so you can actually follow today's session. Uh, so maybe maybe until um, I, I start uh, introducing the session, maybe you guys can get a chance to install these two plugins. And if for sure you will have uh, access to the file itself while we are working. Maybe it's not imp that important to load it now, uh, but just saying. Uh, okay. Uh, with that said, thanks. Thanks so much, Bahablin, for, for the introduction. Uh, today's session, we are going to cover four uh, more, four main important topics generative design, uh, meshing, and mesh manipulation, and basis of kangaroo. So this session, this session should be good for from basic to intermediate level uh, using to Grasshopper. And we are going to cover all of these basics, but at least I, I assume that you guys have some ba some Grasshopper basics so we can build over and we can, you know, you can follow the session. Uh, I'm going to explain very quickly uh, today's workflow. You will see in that right image. Maybe I'm going to use annotate. We are going to start from uh, from the bottom part upwards, where we start first by building our curved networks, and then the roots out of these network, and then we are going to use kangaroo uh, and physics simulation to create our volume out of these paths, and finally we are going to add some details to it. And this example was set to actually introduce you guys to generative design in general and kangaroo on the other hand. I'm not sure guys if you can all turn off your turn on your cameras. Uh, it would be lovely to see you interact with you during the session. Anyway, during the session feel free to interrupt me, ask questions, drop questions chat. I'm I'm open to answer any any questions. Uh, actually today we are going to build the script from scratch together. But I'm going to show you very quickly the overall workflow so you can get sense of what we are going to build today. 
Uh, so you'll see that we'll start first by any boundary, like any curve, rectangle, circle, any specific site. And we are going to set within that site multiple points that identify different entry points and different destinations. And from this, we are going to build our, our network in a way that when we change these locations of, of these points, we will get new pedestrian networks. And after this, we're going to get uh, a path out of it. So we're going to convert uh, this network to, to a path where we can actually use it for so people can hook on or, you know, an actual geometry. And then we are going to use Kangaroo to actually uh, relax this mesh and get the volume out of, of this mesh with all of these inclinations and, and different levels. And finally, we're going to add more details to the final geometry. So I hope I hope this session. Uh, I hope you can guys. I hope you guys enjoy the session and find it easy to follow. It should be it should be covering a few basic stuff. So I hope you guys can can follow it. Um, do you have do you have any questions guys before we start? Uh, are you good with installing plugins? Or good on your side? Um, can you please uh, say again the plugins, Kangaroo and what the other one? So yeah, so we are going to use three things. Uh, you should have them within the drive folder. So first, Kangaroo two. I hope you guys okay. installed Rhino seven because it's 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 easier to follow with Rhino seven. So Kangaroo two, Fatner, and last thing should be relative neighborhood. Okay, so so one, two, three. And you can find uh, the last two guys in our drive folder. OK? OK, good. Yeah, we are good to go then. Uh, so first, I will draw. So I have here my Rhino 7 open. And, and on the side, I have Crossover. And I will start by drawing a curve here in Rhino, so maybe like any curve uh, that resembles your, your site or any specific location with this. Okay. And uh, we'll reference that curve inside Crosshopper by getting a curve and right click set one curve. So this by this time, I will have this curve inside my Crosshopper. And actually, now I want to populate random points. So I don't want actually to, to add a specific point, I just want to add any random points. First around the edge, and secondly inside that boundary. So we need to have two sets of group, two sets, one around the edge and one inside. And for this, I'm going to use mainly populate geometry component, which we can use only to maybe I'm going to display for you guys full names of inputs and outputs, or maybe not. I'm not sure. Let's let's skip it this way. Uh, so pretty geometry component will just add random points to the curve itself, and we can change the number of points by adding accounts. And maybe I'll change this guy now. Then I can see I'm adding more points by increasing the number that number slider. So this is the first set of point around the edge. And now I actually need to add more points inside. So maybe I'm going to use the same exact component. But first, I'm going to convert that curve into a surface. And then I'm, I'm going to copy again the same component. And now you can see that we have another set inside that surface. But you can see also that sometimes we will have points that are very near to the edge. And maybe sometimes they will be located on the exact edge with this point. And and I want actually to add a, a very small part to avoid this, to avoid points, these points in the surface to go go all the way to the edge. So you will find here uh, the last input in populated geometry called optional pre-existing population, which means that if you give this guy any points, it will avoid placing new points on the same location. So I will simply populate the curve one more time with more random points. 
So now we have like a lot of uh, a lot of points that we want to use, and that will be off this guy, and they will just insert the output in this one. So now you can see then the other component is only populating points inside that surface, and it actually doesn't you know populate any points around the edge. So now we can have our two sets ready, one around the edge, and one inside the surface itself. And maybe I'm I'm I will group them so you guys have the chance to to follow a bit. So edge points and region points. And maybe I'm going to remove both of these number sliders from group like this. And we can also add a last number slider to the seed inputs. And I guess you guys familiar with this input, which means that when you change the seed value, it keeps the same number of points, but just change uh, the possibility of populating these points. So it's it, it's just you having more iterations using the same counts. So that's a, what the seed uh, do for now. OK. So I, I hope you guys could follow so far. I'm going too fast or or all good so far. I'm just checking with you guys. So in case we need to slow down or You're to speed up. Good. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Andres. I'll slow down a little bit. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, good to know. I, I will try. Um so yeah, I will just repeat that we have two sets of points, one around the edge and one inside. And I'm going to repeat that we are using these uh, uh, virtual points just to avoid having the same exact points around the edge when we are creating the region points. OK, good. I'll try to slow down. Uh, so the next step actually is to use these points, what we just generated, right? to create our network. And I'm going to use a component called, uh, maybe let me get the link too fast for you guys. Uh, so it's called uh, Relative Neighborhood. And this guy is actually, I mean, the plugin by, by Danny, uh, and it's using uh, the Relative Neighborhood graph to connect few points. So maybe now I'm going to merge these two sets I'm going to save first. So I'm going to merge the data one, the points around the edge, and the data to the points inside that region. So we now have uh, two, the two sets merged together into one list. And I really need to check the output just to make sure that these two sets are merged nicely. But you now you can see that we have two branches in the output, which means that we yeah, we failed to merge them together as a one branch, uh, in one branch, sorry, on one list. So maybe it's better to fit in for D1 and D2, so we can get rid of, of the extra branch and we can all have all of these 14 points into one list. And this is very important because later when we generate our street or our, our network, it's very important to to deal with this a whole set together. Uh, at the same time. So I'm going to search for a relative neighborhood component. And it's not a native component, so you guys won't find it unless you did actually go to the drive link that I shared to you, I shared with you uh, on the Zoom chat and uh, installed the relative neighborhood plugin. It just it's just one component. It's not like a plugin with a whole set of tools, just one one plugin. One point. And now I'm going to connect these points into this guy in the relative components, near the neighborhood component. And you will see here, uh, it, it starts to connect all of these points with different POI lines. And the output of this graph is actually one line. You see, so between each two points, we have one line, okay? And maybe now let's try to go back and change a few parameters. So maybe let's try to change the number of, of points around the edge. 
or maybe let's change the seed so we can see how do we generate different iterations or how we can generate different networks, different curved networks. I guess I will, I will, yeah, I will increase a bit the number of points inside so we can have one nicely uh, connected pool line out of these points. Okay. Okay, it's fun to play with with this guy. Um, yeah, and I guess that's 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 the first step, and that was the mesh network, the curves network that we want to achieve. So maybe now I'm going to to clean up a bit our definition, and I will place, you know, like a like a key stone for this one. So I'm going to name it. Curve, curves network. Okay, and that was the first step actually. So the next step, as as I I did present to you guys at the beginning, when I when I did present the whole flow, is to start now creating our our paths. So now we have a network, and the next step, what what we want to do is actually to create sort of a paths out of this network. And it's a bit challenging because we have a lot of curves that are making T junctions. So it's not, you know, one regular pull line where we can actually offset uh, this pull line in both directions and that's it. Uh, we need really to take care, of, you know, about our intersections, our regions, so we can have one nicely uh, region out of this network. And one other thing related to meshing. I'm not sure. I, I don't think we have much time to talk to you guys about mesh uh, mesh topology and how we can optimize mesh topology to have a, a, a nicely clean mesh. But what I'm trying to do is if we have this network here, like this, I'm trying to do like different quads at each node. So I'm trying to have like separate quads at each node. So later on, when we start meshing our network, we will have only you know few quads that will start redefining them. So yeah, bears me and, and maybe check the next phase where we start to create our, our paths. So maybe I'm going to add like a nicely splitting line here so we can know that we are moving forward to a next. So actually here where we're gonna use, maybe I'm going to hide this guy, control Q. And here I'm going to use Fattener, the Fatten component from the other plugin, the Fattener, or the Fatten plugin that I shared with you guys on G Drive. And this component, maybe let's let's uh, let's also share uh, the developer, the name of the developer, developer of this plugin. Um, so actually, I guess you guys all all you, all of you guys know the guy already. Uh, it's Daniel Piker, the same developer for Kangaroo. And he made that component so they can actually, you know, generate a mesh out of, of, of different curves. So when I connect our graph here, so the graph is a is a, the output that contains all of these curves, curves. So I'm going to connect the graph here. And this guy will generate a mesh. And at the beginning, you will you will see very similar to mesh pipe, for example but it behaves in a wrong way now because I can see that this line is dotted, which means that there are some branching happening inside this list because this line is dotted. So maybe we let's double check this by, by getting an append. And yeah, you can see that we have uh, separate lines and separate branches, and this is not very good. And again, we need to get rid of all of these branches. So that's why I'm going to go to graph output, right click and choose flatten. And the flatten now will get rid of all of these branches and will have one big list of lines. Okay. And within that component, so we did already connect the first input, which is a skeleton curves or lines. And this input is a thickness. So now if, if for example, I, I, I did enter five, 
you'll find that it converted all of these uh, lines into a mesh equal to uh, five meters wet in radius. So you can see now like a nicely connected mesh. And you can see it's nice because it's uh, it's taking care of, of these nodes, these intersections between different different curves. Even in these cases where we have T junctions, we also have a nicely connected node, like here. So this component is very nice, but we need to check what other inputs we can use. So one of these inputs uh, are actually the spheres. And it means here that if we have, so now we can have a defined thickness now. So for each line, we have a thickness, which is equal to 5.5. And spheres means that you can actually control over the node size. So now by thickness, we can control the line width or the, or the mesh width. But by spheres, we can also control as uh, a node size, which means that if I have, if I did actually create a sphere somewhere, somewhere, so maybe don't follow this. This the, the I mean, don't follow uh, follow me for for a few minutes. I'm going just to explain something and and go back and continue working with you. So I will get one point out of uh, the initial maybe merge. Maybe I'll just use merge just to confuse you guys. So I will just get one point, maybe one in, in the middle. Maybe yeah, this point is nice. And I will create one sphere here, okay? With radius of 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 50, sorry, this is too much. With radius of, you know, seven or eight or yeah, something like this meters. So actually this is what we need to do if we need to control, or if we just need to control uh, the node size is to create different spheres. And when we create different spheres, uh, the node should go like this. I mean, the path should go with the thickness that we that from from this guy, and when it reaches a sphere place or the node place, it should increase in its size. So let's actually try this. Uh, let's just connect this sphere that's just created in this one. But you will see because I I did only inputs one sphere, all of these nodes are are following the same one. And what we need actually, what we actually need to do is to generate different spheres at each node, so we can see it's the effect of, of of this placement. So real quick, I'm going to connect all of these uh, points here. I'm going to repeat this step, guys, so you don't actually need to follow me now. And maybe one of them I'm going to know. Uh, so you can see now how it works, right? Because now we have one sphere which equals to five meters. We have only this, this part increasing, you know? We have only this width is increasing, following the same sphere, but the other, all, all of the other parts are just following the, the one meter radius sphere, okay? So this, this is basic works. So for each node, we need to place a different sphere, okay? With the exact same width that we need to apply with a range of, of radius or something. So for this, maybe I'm just going to, to add like an attractor point or something in the middle of our rectangle and just, you know, generate spheres based on the distance between this middle point and all of these spheres, just to simply add uh, different radius for different points. And with this, we can we can we could actually you know control the width of paths, so we can have you know increase and decrease width of different routes or different parts of our structure. So I'm, I was just explaining how it works. So maybe let's now uh, yeah apply the, this tip. So I'm going to get the area. So maybe I'm going to very first rectangle, and I'm going to connect it. You know and has the same curve, so I can use it really far away from this one. Here, for example. And maybe I'm going to wire display faint or something so I don't get confused later with wiring. And here, if I connect this guy here, I'm going to generate like a, like an area point, like the center point of, of this rectangle. You can use any point. I'm, I'm, just def I'm just assuming now that I'm going to use this guy as an attractor point. Or, 
I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with, with attractors. I'm assuming so, but I'm just going to use it as, you know, when it gets far away from this point, the radius is going to be, you know, much, much bigger than than the metal. Uh, so yeah, so I'm going to use pull point. Okay. Uh, so this is a geometry that will pull. And all of these points will be used to be pulled from the center point. So now I'm actually calculating the distance from the center to all of these other points. Okay, these points here. So yeah, basically I'm going to convert all of these distances to a sphere radius. So for example, I'm, I just can now, you know, get a sphere and these points should be the base and these distances should be the radius. But of course, we'll have, you know, much bigger spheres and it's too much. So I just want to actually to, to tune it down and, and decrease all of these values relative to the center points. So for sure, there are many ways to do it, but maybe I'm just going to, to multiply. You see, multiply these values with, with something. So now we are having, you know, we can have different sizes of spheres based on the location of this point. So the logic is the, the, I mean, the more distance we have from the center points, the larger sphere that we can get at these nodes. And let me guys show you how it works by connecting these spheres here. And you'll see now, let me hide everything. You'll see now that the mesh that was generated out of these paths are now it changing its radius somehow based on the same logic that we just set here. Okay. But for sure multiplication won't be enough in our case because maybe someone else wants to reverse that effect. So maybe, yeah, so maybe let's use the old fashioned way and and just remap these numbers. So yeah, I'm going to remap these numbers using the remap number components, uh, remap numbers component and yeah, values. And the source domain should be the min maximum of these values. So the bounds will actually go through all of these numbers and figure out which, uh, which is the lowest number and which is uh, the higher number. So yeah. So I'm going to connect distance with numbers. So the output of this guy is actually, you know, a domain. So it says all of these numbers are from 3.5 to 46. And I'm connecting this one here to the source. So now we're having all our values connected and the source of domain. And the last thing is a target domain, which means that, let me add the construct domain first. And maybe, yeah, maybe from this number to this guy. So this actually means that instead of all of these distances, we are generating new numbers out of remap numbers. So we are remapping all of these values within a new domain that we are, you know, inserting here instead of just having them with their original values. Uh, I hope you guys are, are familiar with the remap numbers uh, workflow. Uh, yeah, and now we can see that we are controlling the the thickness or the radius of this mesh by actually changing the range of the new domain. So by changing this, we're changing the radius of these spheres. And at the same time, we are generating our mesh using pattern component. And maybe I will stop here for a few seconds to, to check on you guys. How are you doing? If you have if you have any questions. I think we have some questions in the chat. Okay, perfect. All good guys. Um okay, nice. So I will just clean a bit our my definitions. Um yeah. Mapping. Uh, 
Okay. And with this, I'm, yeah, we are almost done with creating our mesh. Um, yeah. And because later, as also when uh, when I did show to you guys as uh, the whole workflow, because we need because we need this mesh somehow flattened to the ground, which means that we need this mesh somehow projected on the same plane or the zero plane with no actually like wet or radius. We need somehow to cut the mesh into two into two pieces and then project it to the ground. So which means is let's let's pick it this. Let's pick this mesh for a second in Rhino. I will manage to show it to you here, and then we'll go back to Grasshopper and do it in a in a parametric way. So actually, I need to to make this mesh like this, you know, with a zero. Let me get the mesh wires. Okay, nice. So now we have this mesh like this with a volume, and because later on we are going to use Kangaroo to actually generate. Uh, the inclination or or where people will, will get down, go up and down, I need to flatten the mesh like this. I'm going to scale it to zero to, sh to show you guys how it should look. So it should be that simple, but because we are, in this case, having like two duplicated faces scaled together on the zero plane, we might have issues with the mesh. And maybe this mesh is not valid anymore. And you can see somehow at each point we'll have two faces. And this is not very, very good with what we need actually to do later with Kangaroo. So that's why I need somehow to, where is the mesh? Yeah, here, okay. I need somehow to, to delete all of these faces like this, you know, the faces on the top or even the faces at the lower side. So we now have only, you know, faces. So we at each point we have only one face and then, yeah, we can then scale it to a zero. Only then we won't have issues or we don't, we won't have any duplicated faces. And it's just to need, need to repeat these steps in Grasshopper so we, we can get rid of, of any invalid meshes. So again, we just need to first, if we have this mesh, right? So first we need to delete the lower part, right? And then collapse this one down to the zero plane, which means projection or something. And this is actually the next step. So let's call this, this part, I'm having a, a lot of sketches. So maybe I'm, I'm going to a larger script for a second so you guys can see, I mean, the whole thing coming together. And so this step was creating network mesh. Okay. And this part was uh, will, will be only about mesh projection. Okay, on the zero plane. Okay, it's getting bigger, but yeah, I hope you guys keep it organized as much as possible, as possible, so you can actually, you know, keep keep moving forward. Okay, I'm uh, Jesus guy, and yeah, I just want to say one more time. I was just explaining how it should work on Rhino. And yeah, let's go back to Grasshopper. Uh, so yeah, the output of this part is actually like one big mesh. So we don't have access to different faces. And what we can do actually is to explode that mesh into parts. So that should be the first step if we want to, to delete faces below the zero level. So now we have a list of all of these faces, right? And what, yeah, and what we can actually do is to get the A of each face, okay? So now we have different faces. We can get the A of each face and we can deconstruct that point, that centroid into its X, Y, and Z. So I'm using deconstruct point component to evaluate the Z value now, because if we have the Z value uh, as a negative number, 
that means that I mean this means that this mesh is below the zero level no so I just want to say if the z component is larger than zero then delete these these faces so and this is called conditional operations in grasshopper so I'm going to add larger than z component and I'm going to get any you know small value larger than zero and let's call pattern these faces. So the larger than component, if someone you know didn't use it before, it will compo compare all of these values with a certain number. So it will take 2.8, for example, and test if 2.8 larger than 0.0, I mean 0.01. Yes, it's true, right? Then the output of the larger than will be true. Is negative 2.8 larger than 0.01? No, right? So the output will be false, and and so on. So it will test each number versus that that same value, and it will produce true and false patterns based on on that logic. And for sure, one of the components that work with true and false is a call pattern component, where we can actually connect all of these faces here in the last because here where we need to remove from our faces and connect the pattern here. So now you can see call pattern deleted all of these faces that are below the zero level. Yeah, and, and that's it now. And this is the same thing that we did in Rhino. And yeah, well now we can just project this guy on the zero plane. So the project component will actually you know, get this mesh all the way down to the zero plane, like this. And now we have this mesh uh, split it into parts, and we can just say, yeah, join the mesh back. Okay, and and yeah, and that's it for now. This is how we can. If you have any geometry, and it doesn't really relate to only this exercise. And you want to delete faces based on a coordinates condition, you can use the same format. Like you can start a point, evaluate it if it's larger than another value, and then call pattern, maybe then project, or maybe do another, another thing. But now we are really close to what we want to achieve is you know a nicely clean, flattened mesh on the zero plane, which we can use later to to with kangaroo and inflate it somehow to to create different levels and volumes. I will take uh, I will give you guys a few minutes uh, to catch up. So. And for sure, guys, you will have the recording, you'll have the working files, so you can actually follow the session uh, on your base, um, you know, after after the session. Okay. So let's let's move into the next part now, which is a mesh relaxation, where we actually will use these roots. So now we have, you know, the step two, where we have all of these roots well defined as a one mesh. And the next step is actually to create all of these volumes. Uh, and maybe I just want to, to mention that if we went back at any point and change, you know, the number of points or the seed, we will, we will you know, still have uh, our mesh output by changing the seed or by changing the number of points, the same operation will apply on the new set of points and we will get uh, a new pathos or a new mesh out of these networks. So maybe, yeah, the next part I will, I will slow the base, like, yeah, I will slow, I will slow it up a little bit. Maybe one of you guys didn't use Kangaroo before. So with Rhino 7, you should by default have Kangaroo 2 components. 
uh, or plugin, sorry. So yeah, Kangaroo 2. So Kangaroo 2 is a plugin uh, developed for to simulate physics in Grasshopper. And yeah, it has like a very strong community out there and very nice examples uh, made by, by the developer simulating folding structures, inflating structures, um, mesh collisions, trails, and mesh patients. Yeah, and a lot, a lot of different stuff. Uh, but here we need we need to use kangaroo only to to inflate that mesh or to actually to, to relax that uh, uh, that mesh to have a volume out of these uh, paths. Uh, so imagine that now we need to uh, because now we have like flattened mesh on the ground. Now we need to actually say to to kangaroo that we need to inflate that mesh in the z direction. So we kind of having you know some nicely ramping coming from the edges to the center and so on. Uh, so yeah, that's very, very uh, easy, you know, goal to, to, to set up within Kangaroo. And yeah, let me describe how Kangaroo works. So to make Kangaroo works, we need a few steps. First, let me get scripted better. So first we need our geometry, okay? which we already have from the previous step. And the next part is to have your goals, or let's say to have your forces. So maybe in this, you say that I want to push these all of these points or all of these meshes to Z direction. Or maybe I want to, I mean, to decrease the edge, or maybe I want to do anything. So in this next part or the second part, you need to define your forces. And then that's it. You need just to apply the simulation or to run the simulation in, in Kangaroo. So it's all is the same. You have geometry, you have forces, and you run the simulation. So we have the geometry already, but let's let's see how it works. So for forces, starting from forces, we mentioned that we need to push our points to the Z direction now. And you will find that the first force that we will use from Kangaroo is called load. And you can find it from goals, points, and load. And you can see with this component, you can just uh, uh, get points and a vector, like a direction, and the magnitude for this vector. So you can actually push these points to that direction. But the thing is, Let's let's get let's get points out of this mesh because if you connected this mesh directly to this point, it doesn't make sense because it requires points, not mesh, right? So there are, are many 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 components that extract points from mesh, but maybe let's use also kangaroo. So from this guy, we can see there's something called naked vertices. No, this one from kangaroo mesh naked vertices. Or maybe someone else could use also deconstruct mesh, uh, which is a native component that takes a mesh and deconstruct it into yeah different vertices. But it doesn't really make sense that we work on our mesh with that very low poly geometry, because now you can see we have very low number of points uh, within our geometry, and and that will actually make kangaroo into not to not really work well with these uh, number of points. So maybe maybe we just need to, to redefine the mesh a little bit, uh, or maybe to increase as a number of polygons. So I'm going to get refine component, which you can see it just, you know, increasing the number of quads. And you can, you can also increase the number of quads by adding more levels. So the level zero, not adding any quads, one, two, and so on. And let's actually keep it to two now. So now you can see we'll have more, more, more points. And yeah, and, and the simulation actually depends on how, you know, it, I mean, the number of points is actually like an important factor to, to run the simulation with. Uh, so that, yeah, so now we are starting to, to set our forces. So now we want to say that from all of these points, 
push them to Z direction, right? With a certain value. And that's actually the first, the first force, this one. Okay, the loads. So this one should be here, forces and simulation. And the next thing should be that we say that while you are pushing all of these points in Z direction, keep somehow the length of each edge of this mesh. So there's a component called mesh edges. Instead of extracting points, this one only extracting edges as you can see here. So you can see that it's only extracting the mesh edges without, without extracting vertices. And to start uh, identifying that while pushing these points keep the same length, we can go to the line here, line goes line. So you can see that in, within Kangaroo, they are splitting forces based on geometry. And maybe for, for, from line, you can get the land component, which you can see it just it just tries to keep the same land uh, or decrease the land or somehow adding a tensile forces to that mesh while pushing these vertices to the Z direction. And they can just connect the naked edges and the three edges to this guy. So now it knows that it will try to you know, decrease or to actually add tension forces to all of these edges while pushing these points to that direction. And maybe that's it for now. Maybe let's keep it simple. And let's start with only these two forces, pushing the points to that direction and adding tension forces to all of these edges. And yeah, and that's it. That's it for now. That maybe this is, these are the two forces that we need to add. Okay, so I'll just enlarge the script for a sec so you can guys see what we actually added during the last few minutes. So you can see the mesh and redefine is increasing mesh quads, right? And these two components are deconstructing the mesh, one to vertices and one to edges. And these are the two forces. And let me highlight the forces with a different color. OK. The next step is actually running simulation. So you have your four geometry, your forces, and we need to run simulation. So to run the sim to kangaroo simulation, you need to go to the main tab here get bouncy solver which is this guy right and this is the one that is responsible of running all of these simulations or making kangaroo works actually so we have goals and these are simply the forces that we already set so i can just merge between this one the land line and the loads and connect this one here. And by this, we have already set our our goals. The next uh, input is reset, which is just like a button to reset the simulation by clicking on that button. And the last input is, is a true or false. So by false, it means that it's paused, as it mentioned here. And true means that it's running. And let's now see what's happening. <laughs> you can see whenever we, we hit restart, the two forces, yeah, they are work, they work now because all of these points now are pushed from the Z plane upward now. And maybe if we went to the front elevation, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It's funny how this, this one is flying over way. And this happening because yeah, we did enter two forces, but we didn't mention where and I mean, or maybe what point should stay on the zero zero plane, or maybe where we are actually fixing these objects to the ground. 
So Kangaroo actually did what we exactly, you know, instructed here by moving these points to Z direction and also by keeping the tension forces between all of these edges. So actually the next step or, or the final force that we need to add is where we need to keep our geometry fixed to the ground, okay? And there are many, many ways to do it. Uh, you will find, for example, uh, there is a component called anchor, which you can just, uh, which you can just add, you know, some vertices, and these vertices will be treated as anchor points. So, for example, let's try this one. For example, if we uh, so if this is our mesh. And we need to select only the outer points to be the anchor points, this point on the edge, the component called naked vertices, this one, which will take a mesh and tells you which points are naked, naked points, the last output, and the other ones are closed points. So we have the naked points here on the edge. So yeah, let me get this one down. So this is the third course now, where we need to say, where should we fix our drum tree? So we'll just connect naked points to this guy. So remember, not closed points. Uh, naked points, this one, to anchor points, right? And I'll just try to connect this guy here, OK? And let's try to run simulation one more time. And now we can see it doesn't fly anymore, right? It just goes goes up. And so you can see whenever I reset the forces, it just starts to move from to the Z direction while keeping somehow tension forces between all of these edges. And if I go there and 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 increase the value for the loads. The second forces, you'll see by increasing the value, we are somehow increasing the volume of, of this mesh now. Okay, even if you have like a negative value, like this. Sorry. A negative value, it will go downwards now because if I connect this, this guy here, you'll see the mesh will go to the other direction below the, zero, the Z plane. So here I'm just explaining how it works and how this value is actually affecting the outputs. Okay. And this lens is actually, you know, it says if you didn't uh, enter any length, the starting length will be used, which means that if the value of one is one, you see here it tries to actually decrease all of these uh, edges to one meter. So you can see how it tries to, you know, increase the tension forces, but it actually don't want to, you know, to play with this guy. Or maybe if you increase the value like this, you will get, you know, more more interesting results. Maybe, maybe I'll just reset the simulation so you can see what's happening. So you can see by decreasing or increasing length, you are changing the volume of of the structure okay which actually which actually tries to in, increase or decrease these edges now because these edges uh, are connected to the line inputs okay we have few things to to add or few things to to tweak here to make our, our structure somehow working the first thing is i don't see the mesh now we only see points now and with Kangaroo, if you want to, to keep something displayed, you need to add show component. So show component is only responsible of, you know, selecting a geometry that will be only, sorry, that will be always displayed while you're, uh, while you're running your simulations. So if I want to add this show component now, I will just go there and, and, and add one item. So you see here when I connected show, now we can see our mesh. And let's check the outputs of, of Kangaroo. So you see here you have the iterations, like how many iterations that you have. And it mentions here like we have like 4,000 iterations. And then you have points. And the last thing we have your, your outputs. 
And here you, you will get a mesh and a lot of lines. And because I connected show components at the beginning of the merge, now we are having the mesh as the first item. So maybe I'll turn off this guy and I'll just, you know, list item to get the first mesh, as you can see here. So now we can only see only the mesh as an output, so we can, you know, we can review better uh, our simulation. Any questions so far, guys? Looks good, We're I good? think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good, good. So again, we have our mesh geometry. We have our forces, which show length and loads and anchors, which points are fixed, and merge to merge all of these forces. And the last thing is to run the simulation. OK? One last thing we need to actually see or we need to explore together is how we can you know, make our anchors somehow organic now. Instead of all of these sharp points that we have in our example now. Because now we are using all of these naked vertices as anchor. Now the, the outer edge of our geometry uh, is very sharp now. It doesn't actually respond to any of these parameters. So here I'm going to replace the anchor with something else. So maybe I'm going to delete uh, these two steps and stop the simulation and show you something. So with, mis with mesh edges component, we get two things. We get interior edges, as I mentioned, and we get the naked edge. So now what I'm going trying to do is I'm going to join this boundary, okay? And I want to tell Kangaroo now to give some flexibility to these edges. To, and by flexibility, I mean maybe rotation angle. So maybe I'm going to give this flexibility to these angles here to move freely between a, like a certain domain or something. And there is a, a component or a goal within Kangaroo that do exactly the same. And it's called, yeah, from here, goals angle. It's called rod. And rod component is actually, you know, just taking a pull line controlling the same, uh, you know, something something similar to, to what we have here, the length of this guy, and also the angle angle factor. And here where we where it comes, you know, our added flexibility to, to this guy. So let's, yeah, let's check the last, the last goal. So I'm going to connect the joined boundary. And you can see here that I, I did join all of these naked edges, so we can have only one line. And the land factor could be, you know, anything. We can, it should be something from zero to one, or maybe more than one, where one is, you know, the same exact, uh, the same exact length, because it's a factor. So one means that you are using the original length, you know? And also the angle factor is, is, is something similar. We're also, you know, uh, like adding a variable as a ratio of the original angle. And the last thing could be the bending. So we can have here like both of axial and bending strength. And this could be any number, like like real large number between maybe zero, one thousands, or zero, ten thousands. And you'll notice, you'll notice that within each component of Kangaroo, you'll find there's like a strength value, which means that like which which somehow an indication for how much is component affecting the whole structure. So maybe let's let's connect this guy and, and just see together what happens. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you can see here somehow it's working. You see you see let me let me start. You see it tries somehow now to 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 somehow you know making all of these edges organic but at the same time they are not fixed anymore on the z plane right and we need to go back to this guy and play a bit with with all of these values 
to somehow make it fixed now. So maybe I'm going to decrease this guy a little bit. And also I wanted to introduce to use a damping input in, in the bouncy solver. And this damping is actually, I mean, taking control uh, on, you know, how much is kangaroo affecting the current geometry. And by this, I mean, you see now, when you have like a one value, the simulation is running really fast, okay? But try to decrease the damping, the damping value, which means that the process is still running, okay? But the simulation will actually, you know, go in a very slow speed instead of, you know, just crazy, you know, instead of just, you know, crashing the geometry. So sometimes you need to decrease the damping value so you can have like a better understanding of how your system is working. And now we can also play, you know, with the strength, with the length factor. You can see how the length is affecting the geometry, the angle, okay, and so on. Okay, so now we can see that the road component is giving us the flexibility of making the edge somehow not sharp, not as sharp as it was uh, with the using of, you know, with the use of anchor points. Uh, with this, I guess we can take like five minutes break to stretch our legs, you know, get a coffee or something. And after this, we're going to keep working on it and yeah, and finalize our, our exercise. And this is a good time to, you know, to ask questions if you have any. If not, we can right away go to and take a break. Okay. okay. So maybe yeah. see you guys in five minutes.
Uh, I guess we can go in one minute, so everyone yes. can, can, yes. can get back. I don't know if uh, anyone has any questions. Maybe they were trying something and... Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, any one of you guys uh, is following in real time while we are giving session? <sighs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I shared I shared with you guys the script already, right? No. Uh... I think uh, if someone has joined in uh, later, they must have not got. Yeah. I'll post the link. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I shared the folder uh, with you, Andre, uh, where you will have you know the plugins, uh, images, and files, and within the files you will get the script, you know, which we are we're making together now. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I, 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 yeah, you know, I, for sure I'm going too fast because we don't have, you know, much time to cover everything. Uh, but yeah, I would love to receive the question. I mean, I'm not expecting from you guys that you, you know, that you follow with the same speed <laughs> as mine during the session. But for sure, take your time after the session, uh, check the script, check the recording, and, and yeah, follow it one more time. Uh, so yeah, finally we started to get some questions. So uh, the last tips, okay. Uh, okay, so let me share my screen. So this is a folder that I shared. I'm shared. Uh, I'm sharing with you, Andre. Andre. So yeah, check it. Uh, Andrea, right? Sorry, am I explaining it uh, wrong way? <laughs> So uh, yeah, the last step we did is actually to add the road component, which is very similar to anchor points, right? So we did remove the anchor points where we did explore together how we can fix the naked vertices around the edge by you know adding the naked vertices to this point and just you know connecting this goal to the merge component. Uh, and but we did see like how uh, how sharp was it uh, before or after adding the anchor component. So here I'm adding a different component called Grot, uh, which is a component inside Kangaroo that lets you you know give some flexibility for the angles between a pore line. So we again we are extracting the mesh edges, extracting only the naked edges edge around the structure joining it as a one point line and then uh, adding the angle uh, component. Uh, okay. So I guess that should answer your question. Uh, but yeah, with the road component, I'm not, uh, just check you guys that you guys have, you know, the angle factor, that are, you're changing the angle factor to zero so you can have that smooth curve, and for sure playing with, you know, the bending strands. And Kangaroo is, is actually like like much fun to play with. So you can see that you will get like much different results by playing with different parameters. So for example, go back to your refine and start exploring with, you know, different, different mesh and quad numbers to see what is different between What's the difference between you know different uh, versions, and you'll notice that sometimes when you when you play with with an input, it doesn't really work, no, and maybe your your geometry would crash, because sometimes you need after changing uh, like a major parameter, you need to go back to the bouncy solver and hit reset, and by and by this you will get you know your geometry working. Uh, like just fine one more time. So just take care that sometimes when you change something, you need to go there and, and hit reset. And maybe the, that's why sometimes maybe something is not working. Uh, so yeah, just take care and, and, and don't forget to hit reset. So yeah, let's let's pause that definition for one second and hit reset so we can get the original geometry. And I just want to remind you that the whole idea is that, for instance, if we go back and, and change a seat, for example, 
and to get you know like a whole new mesh, a whole new set of paths, we can go back one more time to kangaroo and set true and set reset. And only then you see we will get like a new mesh generated out of, of this process. And maybe let me probably, you know, custom preview the geometry. So we can actually, oh, I have another one. So can, yeah, we can see it in a proper way. So yes, maybe this. Uh, yeah, nice. And there's also a component in maybe, and yeah, there's also a component in Kangaroo that lets you choose or, you know, pick curves from your geometry. So for example, uh, let me add like a base surface like this, so we can see more experiments. Uh, right click zone. And there's a component in in Kangaroo that lets you choose different curves. It calls warp and drift. I'm not sure if you guys used it before. So warp and drift, if you enter the mesh into this guy, uh, at the very glimpse, it, it, it doesn't really, you know, uh, it, it's not really different between, I mean, it's really different than uh, the mesh edges component. But here you can get the warp and drift, which means that you can get uh, both curves in, in both directions. So you can define whether you want to extract these curves or the other curves in the other direction. And this component is very nice because you can actually extract, you know, uh, one set of curves instead of extracting all of these edges. So I just want to say that, yeah, we can go back at any point, change the seed. But then by changing the seed, we need at each point, go back to Kangaroo and reset the simulation so we can actually run it. And this actually is not, you know, really good in terms of time and and a lot of things. I mean, because, I mean, not every time I want to go back to Kangaroo and had three true and had reset. I just want to, you know, change the network, get a new iteration, and, and that's it. And maybe this is useful in case someone wants to optimize it somehow or, you know, use um, genetic optimization uh, plugins such as Wallacey, Octopus, or anything. Or maybe, you know, use Caramba or, or anything. So now I just want to replace a bouncy solver in a way that it gives me the result right away when we change something. And maybe you know this already, but there's a nice, very nice component in Kangaroo, which calls Zombie Solver, okay? And this is exactly the same. It, it, the same really, uh, it, it works uh, the same as this Bounce T-Solver works. The only difference, it doesn't have like, you know, like a counter. It doesn't work in real time. It will just give you last iteration. Before I did I do any anything, I just need to set the maximum iterations to something very low. Because the default value is like 50,000 iterations, and this is too much. Maybe your PC will crash if, or maybe I mean maybe your file will crash if you try to to use this large amounts of iterations. So I will I will connect this pipe here. And you know it's the same. You just need to you just need to, to connect the same goal objects. And yeah, maybe, you know, we, we just need to replace this guy and then deleting this. So you can see here, maybe I'm going to increase it maybe to 50. So you can see, you can see here that zombie solver is working the same way as other solver. The only, solve, the only difference that you need to uh, define the maximum iterations. And zero means that the simulation is not running at all. And by the, the increasing the iterations, you're increasing the time that the bounce you solver would take to solve this. Okay. So I'm, I'm keeping increasing the maybe, you know, 
just just maybe just 30 from now. Okay, maybe 50, 200. I just want to get, you know, like a nice value where our script is working properly. Okay. Maybe it's this one. Or maybe I'm going to flatten everything. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. But I don't want to increase that much. Otherwise, you know, it will take like a lot of time. Okay, so maybe this is good. I mean, this is enough for our case. I mean, it's just for showing you how you can run it, you know, in asynchronous mode. So now because I said zombie, zombie solver, let's check what happens when we go back and change anything. So if I went back to our network and try to change anything, you'll find that once you change any input or any parameter, your purpose, your process will goes all the way to the zombie solver. And it will, you know, just run it for you without having to, you know, to reset the simulation or to wait for a few seconds until the simulation is done. So zombie solver is somehow, a, sometimes it's nice to really quick, you know, the running simulation without if in case you want uh, or in case you have like a lot of, of values or a lot of parameters that you want to explore on your, your own. And now you can see it's very adaptive somehow to, you know, to adapt to different networks and to get like different iterations based on, on different different outputs. Okay. So I just want to give you I just want to give you like that that option of running zombie solver instead of bouncy solver. So just remember that zombie solver will allow you to do the exact, exact same. Uh, but uh, now I forgot to forgot to set the maximum iterations to five. And yeah, I guess I need to reset the grasshopper file very quick. Uh, or maybe, yeah, let me stop sharing for a sec. Because the max iterations by default is around like five thousands, it's or fifty thousands too much for for uh, our grasshopper definition to handle. That's why the, yeah we need also to to set it to a very low value before we run it. Yeah, let me share my screen one more time. Okay, so now you can see, yeah, uh, like I said, the value to like a very low value, uh, maximum iterations, and yeah, the definition is working more. One more time. Okay, and for sure you know that, you know, if at some point you need to run like a lot of iterations, you can just maybe one of the options is to set your your viewport in a nice way, and to just animate to that number slider. Uh, I'm just recovering what I lost during the last step. Okay. Uh, warp and drift, we use warp and drift to actually extract uh, the mesh edges into different directions. So A and B or, or only B as you guys wish. And now we can go back to Z values. Okay, also, yeah, I mean, we can play with any, any parameters. And I just want to say that if you are controlling the whole geometry from the seed input, and you want to generate like many, many iterations, one of, one of the ways is to go there, right click and hit animate, which will give you, you know, you can browse and set new folder and hit okay. And I'm not sure if you used animate before, but it will record 
a lot of iterations from your site in your definition and extract like many images. Or as I mentioned, if you're, you know, planning to use any, uh, any optimization uh, engines. Is there any button that can connect all the number slider and generate random solution? I mean, this is very similar to your question, no? Because, I mean, in our case, we don't want to change uh, the numbers, the number of points at the edge or, or the middle, uh, but we just want to change the state, no? So yeah, you can connect one number slider with a lot of seed inputs and and change and change it at one click. Hope this answer your, your question. Okay, yeah, exactly. We can use animate. You're welcome. And actually, I'm what well almost done. Maybe I'll stop stop here. Yeah, it's, it's fun to play with this guy, but I just want to stop here. Yeah, thanks. And yeah, the final tab that I want to, to show you guys that we you can extract as many curves as you want from, from this one. But for sure, because we're dealing with meshes, it depends on how many polygons within that mesh. And but for sure we can go back and refine this mesh. So if I want to, if I went to Kangaroo one more time, there's also a component called refine strips. It's very similar to refine, but it also it only increases the number of of, of polygons in into one direction. So you can see. Let me go to one. So this is zero, one, two. Three, so it doesn't increase. So if if you actually did, you know, zoom in here, it doesn't increase both of you know U and V direction. It does only increase edges in one direction. So now you can see it does only increase a vertical of one. And if you want to reverse uh, the effect, you can return. You can use a mesh turn component, so you can actually increase the number of, of curves in the other direction. So you can see without mesh turn. Uh, the refined strips increasing quads into the V direction, let's say, but after mesh turn, it increases the meshes within that direction. Yeah, now, you know, all of these just curves, sorry, I need to extract the warp and width after refined strips. So we did refine strips, you find your strips or your mesh, and then you are extracting your curves out of this mesh. And for sure you have also your mesh here, no? And yeah, and, and those curves, you can convert them to, to any, any geometry. For example, I can use fatter mobsim, but this time I don't want to, you know, to somehow uh, combine them into one geometry. So maybe I'll graph the inputs, right? And uh, sorry, and connect the thickness somehow. So then you are, you know, transforming your your geometry one more time. Sorry, I will join them first because now you can see, you know, when I zoom in, is, there are some, you know, deformations here. So maybe it's it's better to join them first, and then yeah, pattern them. Because the mesh is always producing like separate curves, and sometimes it's good to, to join them first before you know handing it over to different like plugin or processes. And yeah, now I can bake this one. And maybe I, I will un unweld the mesh because it doesn't look very good. Okay, and for sure, yeah, I can I can keep going back and forth, and you know, adding more or keep exploring different options, baking them, and and so on. Uh, yeah, and, and and that was mostly it. 
So just just a quick recap. Uh, we started with generating our mesh network by having like few points and connecting them using like relative points, relative neighborhood. Let me check why I forgot. Yeah, relative neighborhood component. We used Fatin to generate our mesh. Maybe I will. It's it's good to show also the output. We used Fatin to actually control our mesh thickness, providing like different spheres at different nodes. And then we wanted to to flatten the mesh on the zero plane, so that's why we did you know we did remove the the lower part and projected the mesh on the z plane, and then we we did increase the subdivision of the mesh so we can play play with it more within Kangaroo, and finally we added like three forces the rod. This part did change a bit because my 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 grasshopper crashed that way, but but it's the same concept. By adding the forces of rod, by adding the forces of of loads to push points to Z direction, and finally by adding tension forces between all of these edges, and finally running simulation of I mean using Kangaroo, and we we did see the difference between zombie solver and bouncy solver, uh, which one of them zombie solver is running the process uh, internally and gives you the final result while bounty solver is running simulation real time and gives you like multiple iterations uh while you are playing with different parameters and yeah we could see that the zombie solver somehow is 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 nice because when you're you know, when you you know uh when you want to produce as much as iterations uh, as possible uh yeah i guess i'll stop here and 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 check if you guys have any questions but for sure, uh, I would recommend for you guys to watch uh, the recording one more time. Go to the drive folder, download the definition, uh, play with play with it, and you can also find me on Instagram, Shandu Chauke, and you can you know message me, tag me if you have any cool results that you want to share. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions. I think uh, we can even uh, have uh, uh, have the students uh, turn on their mic and video in case you want to ask the questions yourself. You want to maybe share your work or your script and ask uh, any doubts that you guys have. You can always share your screen also. Um, maybe while they're trying to uh, uh, figure out some of the things, I can ask a few questions. Uh, uh, yeah. I think okay. this, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think this was this was a very interesting uh, uh, workflow and uh, combining some of the some of the uh, plugins that we uh, end up using in uh, in in the Grasshopper workflow. And uh, what I wanted to ask was that, uh, how do you go from here uh, to the fabrication bit? Like, uh, what kind of uh, parameters do you also include in your Grasshopper workflow so that you are considering it to uh, make it easier for you to be fabricated? So for example, the last few steps that you were showing were quite interesting where you're using uh, uh, division in terms of strips and all. So if you can throw a bit more light in case you had any issues while uh, you were doing the fabrication of these structures. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I mean, actually, we like I did uh, like a similar workshop again in digital future, like I guess like two months ago, where we uh, focusing more on the stripping part, where we you know we have your mesh as we have here, and you want to move it to the fabrication side. And then it's really different because, I mean, the members that we just did at the final step, it, it doesn't make sense at all, no? Because, it means the, I mean, we don't have, like, structured members and, and we don't have lots of stuff. But, I mean, one of I mean one of the nice studies that we can do here is actually to apply different stripping methods, like the Mark Forms uh, work and, 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 and these different structures. Uh, and this, I mean, it would be interesting so we can, uh, you know, I mean, then we could only have, you know, more control of the mesh, how they would be stripped into port, and then how they, we can unroll them. Uh, and because our, our post is very flexible, we can go back at, at any point 
and manipulate the size, the geometry, and different parameters, and go back to, to check uh, the final unrolled parts. I'm not sure if this answers your questions, but <laughs> I'm just saying that maybe the next step is actually, uh, I mean, explore stripping methods. We don't have time for sure this 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 session to 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 go to the next step, but yeah. But maybe I can share with you more resources for you guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, do we have any questions from YouTube? Um, uh, I'll just check. Okay, perfect. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Please, guys, like play play on your own with the definition. I'm really excited mm -hmm. to see results from your side on Instagram. So yeah, don't be shy. Yes. I mean, finish <laughs> something and, and push it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, I, uh, I think we don't have any questions on uh, uh, YouTube. We, we do have comments for you where uh, people have been uh, uh, saying, uh, uh, some nice things. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I what, mean, what it's, it's really nice to meet you guys today. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what, what's also interesting is that the workflow that you have uh, set from something which converts the curves into a uh, mesh and you're manipulating it uh, using uh, the logic of physics because of uh, kangaroo simulator is, is quite interesting. So, uh, and uh, I think it's 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 these kind of workflows that allow for uh, for the scripts to be more uh, versatile and used uh, uh, in in different uh, methods also. So uh, if you can if you can give some guidelines or if you can give some directions and if the basic curves script could be changed and they could try out some more script. So do you have any any kind of uh, directions for students to take it forward? Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe I will make a, like a new folder within the same G drive. Maybe I like, add more references there, like more nice projects, so they can check. But yeah. for sure, I mean, for instance, I mean, someone can you know change that Cedric tank that I did at the beginning, and and the definition will adapt to to it. Uh, and I guess yeah, it's it's always nice to build your things. I mean, in in, in a flexible way, so you can adapt to different uh, inputs. Uh, but for sure, I will try to add more references into into our. Uh, within our redrive. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, looks like it uh, brings us to the to the end of the session. Yeah, yeah. I'll just very quickly uh, do a summary of our upcoming events. And in case still students have any question, we've got some time. And uh, we can always take up some more uh, question after after I finish. So yeah. I'm just going to stop your screen share. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So uh, yes, this this was a very interesting uh, session. I think uh, it was a it was a very uh, simple workflow, uh, and you can find all the links uh, and the tutorial on our YouTube channel. We have a complete archive of all the tutorial sessions that have happened in uh, past. You can you can always go uh, on the link and uh, just uh, follow the uh, follow the tutorials. Uh, our upcoming session include uh, our tomorrow's session with the uh, Professor Neil and uh, uh, for the doctoral consortium with FIU DDES and Digital Futures. These sessions have been uh, happening since the, since the last uh, couple of months. And this uh, series is specifically designed for AI, neuroscience and architecture. And uh, these are philosophy sessions and you are free to join on uh, YouTube. All the lectures are available again. Uh, tomorrow's session brings together uh, David Chalmers and his uh, ideas on uh, neuroscience. It's going to be one of our uh, very interesting session and a thought-provoking session. Next week, we also have um, uh, Digital Futures Farsi Talk. Uh, where uh, where our uh, session would be held uh, held at 8 p.m. Uh, Tehran time or at 11:30 a.m. Uh, EST. Do check out all those events will be streamed online. 
and we have a whole calendar of event uh, coming up uh, this month uh, keep following us on uh, discord if you're interested in joining the team you can always write to us on info at the rate digital futures dot world and our discord link will be placed on the chat for your reference thank you so much thank you hashim and uh, we look yeah, forward to another <laughs> We look forward to another session where we kind of explore uh, some more uh, interesting workflows and simple workflows. In case yes, sir, anyone has any questions, you can always leave it uh, in the chat chat box on our YouTube or reach out to Hashim uh, himself. Thank you, Bhavla, and thank you for, for inviting me today. Yeah, it was really nice to meet you guys. Uh, thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.